Well, good morning, guys. Uh, this is the second week of our Foundations of Faith uh, segments that we're doing here in the middle community hour. Um, this is just a, a good opportunity to come together and kind of renew what we know about what we know about theology, about what we know about God. Um, so this is also a different way that we worship. We worship God with our mouths when we sing, and we worship God with our minds when we dig into who he is. So uh, today we'll be going through the next two pieces, the next two statements of our statement of faith, the human condition and the person of Christ. I'll read off our statement on the human condition. We believe that God created Adam and Eve in his image, but they sinned when tempted by Satan. In union with Adam, human beings are sinners by nature and by choice, alienated from God and under his wrath. Only through God's saving work in Jesus Christ can we be rescued, reconciled, and renewed. So St. Augustine, if you've uh, ever studied or looked into theology, you probably know who St. Augustine is. Um, he was an African theologian, one of the first great theologians, and probably the most important theologian in Christian history. Every sect, every uh, piece of Christianity today is, not, not the magazine, actual Christianity today, uh, is affected by his work. And uh, one thing that made his work so poignant, and so heavily embraced by everybody was his understanding of the human condition. He was ravaged his whole life uh, by the fact that he could not stop sinning. He, it, it hurt him. It literally hurt him that he couldn't, or he felt like he couldn't stop sinning. Uh, he wrote a book called The Confessions, where he went, it was basically an autobiography but it went through his whole life through the lens of his sins. And then he pontificated on theology through that. But there was this one event that disturbed him especially. He and some friends, when he was a child, went and stole some pears from a neighbor's pear tree. And he didn't steal them because uh, he was hungry or starving and needed them. He didn't even steal them because he wanted them. Instead, they basically loaded up a wheelbarrow and took these pears and then fed them to a bunch of pigs. He literally said, later on in his life, he writes this in his 40s, he says, I did this just because I wanted to sin. His quote is, it was foul and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. And, and in this, he hit something that is crazy and innate in humanity. is that we sin for the sake of sinning. That's a part of what we're going to talk about today. But he also had a great understanding of humanity being created in the image of God. So first, humanity is created. Adam and Eve need to be uh, literal. We need to have a literal understanding of Adam and Eve actually existing, or else our theology of the fall and our theology of original sin and our theology of Christ's role in our redemption it all kind of falls apart, especially as you read through Romans. A lot of Paul's theology in Romans is based on the fact, especially Romans 5, that Adam was the archetype for humanity. Adam was the representative for all of humanity, and Christ, likewise, was the second Adam. Second thing is we are created in God's image. This is important for a lot of reasons, but just a few reasons are this separates us from the rest of creation. It's not... Our physical stature, as some people said, some people said we walk on two legs, and that separates us from the rest of humanity. And for a while, a few theologians actually said that that is the image of God. We physically look like God because we stand straight up. Um, it's, it's not that. It's not our mental capacity that sets us apart from creation. It is that we are created in the image of God. And we are the only creatures. Not even angels are mentioned as being created in the image of God. So this sets us apart for, specific, for a specific role within uh, creation. In Genesis 6, God lays out the punishment for murder. If you murder somebody, the punishment is death. 
Why? Not because you killed something within the same species as yourself, but because you destroyed something, someone who was a bearer of the image of God. This also comes with responsibility. Uh, As God creates humanity in his own image, he says, let us create them in our own image, and then he gives us responsibilities. And he tells humanity, he tells Adam and Eve, you need to steward the land. You need to uh, be fruitful and multiply and steward the creation that I have created. And finally, this, this idea of the image of God. It doesn't stop in Genesis. It continues throughout the, entire, the entirety of Scripture. In Colossians 3.10, we see that uh, in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, our minds are renewed in the image of their Creator. But uh, humanity, though being made in the image of God and given this uh, special role as representatives of God on earth, given special responsibilities, they sinned. Adam and Eve sinned when tempted by Satan. And this is essential. Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, Satan did not force them to sin. They were not made to sin. When we sin, we are not made to sin. We sin. Sure, Satan provides motivation for the sin, but they chose it. And in that, uh, we are united with Adam. Human beings are sinners by nature and by choice, alienated from God and under his wrath. This uh, idea of being in union with Adam is, is the idea of original sin that Paul talks about in Romans 5. All of humanity is united with Adam, who is the representative of humanity. But it also sets up for a parallel with Christ. We are united with Adam in our sin, but that allows the second Adam, as Paul calls him, Jesus, to come and do a work that, in which we can be unified with him as new creations. This is also uh, the core of the human condition, being alienated from God and under his wrath. If you think of what St. Augustine was going through, what his inner turmoil about uh, the pear tree, he didn't understand why he would sin just to sin. And it was because we're united with Adam and because we choose to sin and we're sinners by nature, we have rejected God and we're in desperate need of saving. And the result of this is always going to be being under God's wrath. But... There's good news, and and the reality of humanity is that there's more past that. Uh, Jesus, through the work that Jesus did, becoming human and dying on the cross and being raised again, he rescues us from the consequences of sin, from the consequences of us rejecting him. He reconciles us to a new relationship, and then he renews us into the image of God when we are glorified with Christ at the resurrection. So what does it mean to be human? What it means to be human is that we were beautifully and wonderfully created. We were created separately from the rest of creation. We were separated for a specific role, for a specific role of leadership within creation, and given responsibilities. But we rejected all of that just as we rejected God. And so because of that rejection, Um, We were in desperate need of saving. But Jesus comes and rescues and reconciles and renews. So I want to spend a little bit of time here praying. We just heard from Stephen, or you will hear from Stephen, that uh, we have a God who uh, delights in people persistently praying. So we are going to spend some time in prayer, just a couple minutes, uh, by yourself or with the people around you. And I just want to spend time confessing to God our sinful state and then thanking God for saving us despite that. So let's spend a couple minutes in that.
All right, as we just closed this time in uh, looking at the human condition, the fallen state of humanity, it brings us naturally into the person who saved us, Jesus. Now, uh, I, I just don't want anybody to be confused or maybe upset with me when I don't talk about the atonement or the work that Jesus did in his ministry because this segment is specifically on the person of Jesus. And the, the work of Jesus is a, another segment, and that's coming next week, and Stephen will bring that to you guys. Um, but uh, there's just too much within those two pieces of our statement of faith to all include into one week, so we're going to treat them separately. Um, but here's, here's our statement on the person of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. Fully God and fully man, one person in two natures. Jesus, Israel's promised Messiah, was conceived through the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father as our high priest and advocate. Okay, so uh, if, if you've looked at a lot of statements of faith before, or if you compare our statement of faith to a lot of other statements of faith across other churches, especially evangelical ones, you'll notice that a lot of these phrases sound pretty familiar, especially in that first sentence. Uh, the reason for that is that um, even though most statements of faith say pretty much the same thing with different wording emphasizing different things, uh, when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ, it's pretty much uh, essentially, th this phraseology has been developed over centuries, and, and it pretty much essentially has to be this or, or similar wording. And, and I'll explain why. Um, basically, when the, when the church was new, and when the early church was rising and spreading, they knew exactly who Jesus was. They were only a few generations from the apostles and from Jesus himself. But uh, as, as the early church got more and more removed in time from the apostles, uh, people started influencing their theology with uh, their own cultures. And so they started wondering, how can God also be man? And so it didn't really make sense to them, and they decided to explain it their own ways. And so out of this came reactions from the church. The church said, no, this isn't our understanding of God. And so they came together and they formed these councils with all of the leaders of the church across the world. And then out of these councils, they, or councils, they developed these creeds. And these creeds are what we get this phraseology from. So the first phrase, Christ is God incarnate. This came at the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. Um, say that five times fast. Uh, this, they, they came together in Constantinople to make this creed because there was a man named Arian, and he was supposedly a Christian leader, and he started teaching that God didn't really become man. Jesus was just a normal man, and then he lived a pretty good life, and God said, well, I'll adopt you, basically, as my son. And so Arianism, along with adoptionism um, and a few other heresies, uh, came about saying that Jesus was actually man, and God just kind of brought him into the fold. So that's, where this, this, that's why this statement is so important. Uh, Christ is God incarnate. God came to earth and put on flesh to dwell among us and live incarnationally with humanity. And the, the second phrase, fully God and fully man, one person in two natures. This is commonly called the hypostatic union. This came about as a result of uh, many heresies, but also uh, docetism was a main one. And docetism taught that Jesus was God, but he wasn't human. So God just kind of sent a, a phantasm, is what they called it, basically a hologram, uh, down to earth, and everything that Jesus did was not really bodily. It wasn't really fleshly. He didn't really die, and he wasn't really resurrected. Obviously, that comes up with a, a whole bunch of problems biblically. And so the church heard this and was like, absolutely not. So they gathered together, and uh, they, they made this. At the Council of Chalcedon, they made this statement. 
that God is, or Jesus is fully God and fully man. And it's important because he cannot be a mixture of part and part. He, he can't be sometimes one and sometimes another. He has to be fully God because that's the only way he can, he can refrain from sin. It's the only way that Jesus could present himself as a blameless sacrifice for humanity is if he is fully God. It's also the only way that Jesus could have defeated sin and death in the resurrection. Jesus wasn't the first person to be raised from the dead. I mean, Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he didn't defeat sin and death. Also, there was a man in the Old Testament who fell into the grave of Elisha when he died, and he rose from the dead. He didn't defeat sin and death. But Jesus did because he was fully God. He was also able to forgive sins. In Mark 2, 7, um, he tells a, a paralytic man, your sins are forgiven, and the people, um, specifically the, Pharise- the Pharisees and the scribes, kind of freak out. And they're like, well, only God can forgive sins. And he's like, yeah, because I'm fully God. <laughs> and so only God can forgive sins. So if Jesus wasn't fully God, he wouldn't have been able to forgive our sins on the cross. Also, he has to be fully man. Uh, maybe the best way of describing this is the way that Gregory Nasiasis did. Um, also, A.W. Tozer, if, if you have read from him, he relies heavily on this phrase from Gregory Nasiasis. Just so you know, I'm just making up that pronunciation. I have no idea how that's pronounced. <laughs> Um, the unassumed is the unhealed. So he said that meaning that if, if Jesus didn't take on part of humanity, then he would not have healed that part of humanity. So the fact that Jesus took on flesh, human flesh, became physically a man, means that when he was resurrected, uh, that promise of our resurrection comes true. And the fact that he took on a f- fully a human nature, he had human nature, That means that he could redeem our human nature. He had a human mind. He can redeem our human mind. Jesus was also tempted in every way as a human. Uh, This is important. It it, it means that we have a God who can sympathize with us. We have a God who loves us despite what we're going through and despite that he went through the same things and didn't sin, but he he still knows how hard human life is. And so we can't say God doesn't understand what I'm going through because Jesus went through the exact same things. And this is especially powerful to me. Jesus humbled himself to become a man. Philippians 2 says he humbled himself to the form of a servant. And what's especially powerful is that wasn't just for his 33-year ministry on earth. Um, Jesus humbled himself into being a man, into humanity for eternity. When Jesus was resurrected, he came back in a resurrected human body. And when we see him in Revelation, he has that same resurrected human body. Jesus humbled himself to our state to forgive our sins for eternity. Now, moving on, Jesus is Israel's promised Messiah. This is a beautiful link to the Old Testament, which is simply bursting at the seams with references and promises of Jesus as all of history unfolds and culminates in the person of Christ and his work. The one from the line of David who would save God's people and eventually establish God's eternal kingdom. That's why reading the Old Testament makes our understanding of Jesus even that much more rich. Now, the next line um, that we would go through, he lived a sinless life and he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Um, I'm, don't hate me, I'm going to brush over this because this is under work of Christ. So I talked to Stephen and he's going to go over this next week. Um, so we don't need to make it redundant and I don't want to, I, I don't have enough time anyways. So uh, finally, uh, he sits at the right hand of God the Father as our high priest and advocate. Christ is our great interceder, advocating for us to the Father. This is maybe best expressed in the fact that when the Father looks at us sinful, broken, rebellious people, instead of seeing us, he sees Christ. Now, I I just want to be encouraging in 
in this fact. When, when, I, when there have been all these creeds and these councils over the years, it wasn't that they didn't know who Jesus was and they were developing a theology over time. No, they had a good, solid theology from the beginning of who Jesus was. They knew he was fully God and fully man, fully in human nature and with uh, God's essential nature. But, but they just hadn't, they hadn't uh, scrutinized it yet. They hadn't defined it as succinctly as they had to. And, and as all of these heresies popped up and all these people started saying that Jesus was uh, something or someone that he wasn't, they realized, well, we need to have a tight definition of who he is. So over time, they developed this definition. It was a definition they already believed at the beginning, but that they hadn't articulated so let's, if we could get everyone to stand up, and we will say together these two pieces of our statement of faith. We believe that God the Father, oh, sorry. <laughs> we believe, I started at the beginning, but we're on section three. Uh, we believe that God created Adam and Eve in his image. But they sinned when tempted by Satan. In union with Adam, human beings are sinners by nature and by choice, alienated from God and under his wrath. Only through God's saving work in Jesus Christ can we be rescued, reconciled, and renewed. We believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, fully God and fully man, one person, in two natures. Jesus, Israel's promised Messiah, was conceived through the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father as our high priest and advocate. All right, let's pray together as we close. Lord, we just thank you for the truth of the words we just said. That even though we sinned and we chose sin and we chose rebellion, you chose to dwell among us as fully human and fully God and save us from our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.